So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start. Just a reminder to turn off your cell phones. If you do not want your photo taken, please let the Board of Trade staff know. We use photos for both internal and external publications. So everyone, good afternoon. I'm Anita Huberman. I'm President and CEO of the Surrey Board of Trade and Honorary Captain of the Royal Canadian Navy. And welcome to our beautiful city, Surrey, British Columbia. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are on the traditional and unceded territory of our Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Kwantlen, Keitsi, Semiamu, Tawasin, Coquitlam, Keikut, and our Inuit and Métis peoples. They have a profound connection to the land and water that surrounds our great city of Surrey, and they are economic development partners with the business community. I'd like to just start off by saying that, uh, you know, it was March 6th, um, 2020, when we had Premier Horgan right here at Northview Golf Course delivering his post-budget address. And then it was three days later that the World Health Organization issued a global pandemic. And two days later, the Surrey Board of Trade, we shut our doors uh, to our office, sent all the staff home to work from home, and we had no idea what the future would bring us. But everyone, we have made it through to the other side. In an unprecedented way, we had business working together with government, working together with our healthcare system. Never before has this happened. And we have learned a lot. We have many challenges and opportunities still before us. But it was an unprecedented partnership between those three agencies. And of course, uh, with Premier Horgan, you know, we met with him actually every single week. There was about 10 of us uh, that were on a conference call with him every single week talking about what is happening on the ground. And uh, I know Premier Eby, John Horgan, was uh, your mentor and is your mentor. And uh, we wish him the best uh, into the future. So I'd like to thank all of you for being here today. We could not have events like this without sponsors. So thank you so much to our co-presenting sponsors, BD and the BM Group. Our community sponsors, Quatlin Polytechnic University and Simon Fraser University. And our ongoing partners of the Surrey Board of Trade called our Progress Partners, our Western Community College, BDC, the Business Development Bank of Canada, the Chambers of Commerce Group Insurance Plan represented by SNF Benefits, the law firm of Faskin, Scotiabank, and uh, thank you so much for being here and also for supporting Surrey's city building business organization. A round of applause for them. Some of our government representatives are in the house today. I'd like to welcome them. So uh, you, you can applaud after I announce each person. Let's welcome the MP for Cloverdale, Langley City, John Aldag. <laughs> the MP for Fleetwood, Port Cal's Ken Hardy. BC's Minister of Labor and MLA for Surrey Newton, the Honorable Harry Baines. <laughs> BC Minister of Forest and MLA for Surrey Wally, the Honorable Bruce Ralston. <laughs> BC's Minister of Education and Childcare and MLA for Surrey Green Timbers, Rachna Singh. BC's Minister of State for Trade and MLA for Surrey Fleetwood, the Honorable Jagrup Brar. 
We have an amazing amount of ministers right here based in Surrey, so thank you so much for your economic commitment to Surrey. We also have Gary Big, MLA for Surrey Guilford. <laughs> Ginny Sims, MLA for Surrey Panorama. <laughs> Mike Starchuk, MLA for Surrey Cloverdale. Her Worship, the City of Surrey Mayor, Brenda Locke. Her Worship, the City of White Rock Mayor, Megan Knight. Semiamu First Nation Chief, Harley Chapel. And our City of Surrey Councilors, Linda Annis. Mike Bowes. Doug Alford and Gord Hepner, City of White Rock Councilor Elaine Chung, and Semiamu First Nation Councilor Janine Cook. Thank you so much for being with us today. Well, I did. But that's, that's the sound of Gerard Bremo. He's one of our governors for the Surrey Board of Trade and with the Center for Child Development. So great plug, Gerard, great plug. The Surrey Board of Trade, everyone, we are one of the top 10 largest chambers of commerce boards of trades in Canada. There's 430 of us. We support business, bring business into the city through a very diversified service portfolio. And to tell you more, please turn your attention to the screens to watch this video. As one of the fastest growing cities in Canada, Surrey, Surrey. Surrey is an opportunity city. The Surrey Board of Trade is the concierge of connections. Uh, Rick Mann from IOM Property Group. I'm a director of development and construction. We rely on the Surrey Board of Trade um, for a lot of advocacy and research that we don't actively go out and find, really. Like, there are things on there that I had no idea about and I get the email, I get the web link, and uh, it really affects us in a big way. The Surrey Board of Trade is focused on making Surrey an opportunity city by instigating change at the different levels of government, offering a variety of business support services, international trade support services and being the concierge of connections for the business community in Surrey. My name is Rowena Rosati. I'm the Vice President of Healthcare and Innovation here at the Health and Technology District by the LARC Group. We focus on a lot of health and technologies and how we can bring different technologies and innovative healthcare solutions into the hands of clinicians. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of information uh, and support that Surrey Board of Trade offers to these companies and it's um, an opportunity for me to be able to translate what the Surrey Board of Trade is doing for some of those companies and helping those companies to succeed. If it's in the agricultural sector or in the retail sector, if they're needing a government connection, if they have an issue related to government, we are there for them and we have a proven track record of success to ensure that businesses are helped when they need it in a timely way. You know, the Surrey Board of Trade is it's a, it's a great organization because anybody who is involved in that organization wants to be a more proactive member of the community. So having an opportunity to connect and network with those individuals helps our business become better. So the Surrey Board of Trade offers an immense amount of support for businesses at all levels, including entrepreneurs and startup businesses. There are resources that help a business that they wouldn't necessarily be able to afford to contract on their own, and it allows those to be accessible, sometimes free of cost. It also creates opportunities for networking.
Whether you're a new business that's just opening up shop in, in Surrey, uh, Surrey Board of Trade has to be one of your top destinations. It will connect you with a lot of the great minds in the organization, a lot of great minds in the community that can help. So whether you're a small business or a medium-sized business or a large business, starting out or expanding, we have the connections. We have the resources to ensure that you have what you need during your journey as an entrepreneur. And now please help me welcome Todd Yoon, president of Industrial at Beatty, to the stage to introduce our keynote speaker for this afternoon. Over to you. Thank you, Anita, and thank you to the Surrey Board of Trade for inviting us here today. I'm honored to have the opportunity to introduce our Premier. For those of you who aren't familiar with BD, we are an industrial and residential builder who has worked not only in Surrey, but throughout Metro Vancouver for almost 70 years. Our roots in Surrey go very deep. Having worked with the community for, of those 70 years, 30 of them, we have feel very privileged to have had the opportunity to work with several municipal administrations, the province, and members of staff, and together we've delivered some groundbreaking industrial projects to the city of Surrey. To date, we have developed almost 200 acres of industrial land in Surrey and completed almost 4 million square feet of new construction. More importantly, we have been fortunate to work with numerous major corporations who now call the city of Surrey their home. These draw, these, pardon me, these companies drive critical jobs and tax revenue through their operations. The city of Surrey is an absolutely critical region for our business. As the largest growing city in Metro Vancouver, Surrey is a true economic driver for this province. This makes organizations like the city, Surrey Board of Trade, who advocate for businesses like ours, absolutely essential and we thank them for all their hard work and dedication that they have to companies like ours. Now to the more important matter at hand. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce your keynote speaker this afternoon. And I have to tell you, after reading the uh, biography notes, uh, his resume makes you feel quite useless <laughs> as an individual. Uh, as many of you already know, Premier E.B. was the longest serving Attorney General in the past 30 years. In addition to taking on the AG role in 2020, Premier Eby was also appointed as the Minister of Housing. So that's two major portfolios at once. I can tell you that those of us in the real estate industry have long recognized the Premier for his pragmatism, his commitment to action, and his willingness to work collaboratively for some time now, and he had made great strides on the housing front and in the real estate side. Before being elected as MLA, for Vancouver Point Grey, he was an award-winning legal and legal scholar and lawyer, an adjunct professor of law for the University of uh, British Columbia, president of the HIV AIDS Legal Network, and served on the Vancouver Foundation's Health and Social Development Committee. Despite an incredible career and a long list of monumental accomplishments that any parent would be proud of, Premier Eby decided that there was more to be done for his province. And in November of 2022, he was sworn in as British Columbia's 37th Premier. Premier, thank you on behalf of all of us today. Thank you for your service and your dedication to this province and the people of BC. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Honourable Premier David Eby. Thank you uh, so much for the kind introduction, Todd. It puts me in mind of uh, when I told my mom I was going to law school and she started to cry and I thought she was so happy that I was going to law school and she said, you know, I always thought you were gonna go to med school. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she's proud now, I, I don't, wanna, <laughs> don't, don't wanna overstate things. 
Um, thank you uh, very much for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to work with you and your colleagues at BD and, uh, and for the work you do helping build our province. Uh, and I want to thank Balraj as well uh, for the BM Group uh, sponsoring this event as well uh, and your work on housing and other projects. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I'll join Anita acknowledging uh, we're on the territory of the Coast Salish people, uh, Semiamu, Kwikwetlam, Kakite, and Sawasam First Nations. Uh, partnership with Indigenous people is key to our government's uh, work to date and the work that we're going to do, and I know it's a priority for the Surrey Board of Trade as well, so thank you for that. I was making a list of the electeds in the room so that I could join in welcoming them, and I ran out of space on my page. I think we've got enough MLAs for quorum for Legislative Assembly today, so let's get some things done while we're here. You know, we're all in the room. Um, I, uh, uh, it's just an indication of the work that the Surrey Board of Trade has done to build connections between business, uh, First Nations, governments of all levels, uh, and congratulations, Anita, to you and your team uh, and the board for, for making that happen. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about uh, Budget 2023 and, uh, and our shared vision for a strong, uh, clean economy here in British Columbia and a strong local economy and community here in Surrey. Uh, that is our shared goal, and I think we can deliver on it together. Um, when you uh, uh, reflect on, uh, on the remarkable growth the dynamism of Surrey, uh, it's no surprise that so much of our government's work has focused on what's happening in Surrey and how we can better support the work that you're doing here. Um, we have committed to uh, landmark investments here uh, that are in progress. Um, the uh, new Surrey Hospital is the l single largest healthcare investment south of the Fraser in British Columbia history, and a new cancer center there as well funded by an announcement we made a couple of weeks ago around our 10-year cancer care strategy. A new, uh, <laughs> a new uh, medical school at SFU Surrey. This is the first new medical school, the SFU table, like, not sure about whether, sure. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the the uh, first new medical school in uh, 50 years in Western Canada and focused on training medical professionals, doctors, nurses, and others that are committed to community care and so critical in a community like, Her uh, like Surrey that's facing uh, remarkable growth. Uh, the Surrey to Langley Skytrain. Uh, the, first three, uh, the first rapid transit expansion south of the Fraser in 30 years. Uh, we are building and expanding 18 elementary and secondary schools in Surrey to keep up with the pace of growth. So this, this budget is intended to build today for a stronger tomorrow, and it's focused on uh, the priorities that we've heard from British Columbians, priorities I know you share. The priorities of British Columbians are our priorities too. Uh, have heard from British Columbians about health care. They're concerned when they go to hospital, they're not going to get the care that they need, uh, that care is not available where they are, uh, that they're not able to access family doctors. Uh, affordable housing. I guess the good news is it's rain. Um, it'll have a shovel-free weekend. Uh, affordable housing. Uh, building more affordable homes faster across the province. Help with rising costs, lots of people and businesses grappling with rising costs across our economy, uh, provincial economy, but also around the world. Uh, safer and healthier communities as a whole. Um, we believe that by building up people, by building up our communities, we're building up our economy as well. That's a belief that has shaped our government's choices for the last five years under Premier Horgan, and it is the same belief that drove our decisions around budget 2023. Uh, and the results uh, that we've seen to date are clear. We had uh, the best uh, recovery coming out of the pandemic uh, in Canada, economically speaking. More people are working now than before the pandemic, and it's important to note that three quarters of that job growth was women. And uh, the reason I specifically note that is because I believe, and uh, I think it's true, that our investments in childcare were a key reason why we saw so many women able to return to the workforce. Um, just to give you uh, some idea of the scale of the childcare work, uh, in Surrey alone, we're building more than 3,000 spaces, almost half are already open. And we've seen uh, generally uh, in the business community, uh, 
remarkable bounce back from the pandemic in 2021, the most recent year for which we have data. Uh, the number of businesses here grew more than in every other large province across Canada. But we know that there's more to do. There's uh, global instability, there's threats of global slowdown. And so how do we keep BC's economy strong uh, through this time? So you will see a focus on our government reaching out to trade partners to expand opportunities for BC business, to diversify our opportunities, and to build on our strengths. Uh, later this month, I'm going to Washington, for example, to attract business investment to British Columbia and build our relationships there. Looking forward to a trade mission to Asia this spring, uh, Korea, uh, Vietnam, Philippines, uh, and Japan, uh, which will unlock even more opportunities. Uh, and more work to do, uh, Jagrup Barr, our Minister for Trade, uh, helping lead that work for us. One of the key pieces that I've heard from, I, when I was in Toronto, I met with uh, uh, the major pension funds, uh, major capital funds uh, across Canada, uh, and talked to them about what their priorities, what they were looking for in terms of when they were placing capital investment. And, and Overwhelmingly, and I'll say um, I was surprised the degree to which this was influential for them, the, the environmental, social governance, the ESG measurements, making sure that you're looking after people, that you're operating ethically and you're considering the environment is critically important for them and that British Columbia is measuring that information so that we can share it with them so that they can be accountable to their pension holders, that they are making investments that are consistent with ENG principles. Our high standards around partnership with First Nations, around climate, around environmental protection. For years, we were told that these were liabilities, but they're actually a strength for us now when it comes to major capital investment for our province. Uh, there's a lesson in that. Um, now, the, the one lesson that we can take from that uh, is how uh, we work together as government and as business and in particular, um, whether we adhere to a philosophy that government needs to get out of the way so that business can get things done, or uh, whether government needs to do everything because business can't be trusted. Uh, both of those are completely false structures. Uh, increasingly, people understand that government and business need to work together to create opportunities for people and to build our economy. The pandemic, if anything, showed us that we're stronger when we work together. I mean, that's how we, in partnership with uh, uh, healthcare workers in partnership with uh, tech companies. That's how we built the largest vaccination program in our province's history, working together. Uh, that's why we provided half a billion dollar in grants to small and medium sized businesses during the pandemic. That's why we delivered more municipal tax flexibility. That's why we cut the small business tax rate. Um, we're actually home to the second lowest small business tax rate in uh, Canada. Uh, that's why we increased access for larger businesses to the small business corporate income tax rate by raising the ceiling from 15 million to 50 million in taxable capital. Now, I know that the last few years have brought uh, some really serious challenges that we just, people uh, did not anticipate. Uh, but they have confirmed, I think, and I hope you agree, that government can be a force for good in building our economy and working with business. Uh, when we actively work to build a platform for economic success in our province, that benefits BC business, and we do so by building up our people, and that's exactly what we're doing. Last year, testament to our success, our shared success, uh, we saw the highest net migration into our province in the last 60 years. Uh, in the first two quarters of this year, we broke last year's record. And I don't have to tell people in this room, you live in Surrey, you know uh, that our province has been growing quickly. But that growth needs to be supported so that we take advantage of the benefits that it brings. Uh, and that's why we're putting our multi-billion dollar surplus to work for people in the province right now. Just a few weeks ago, we launched the Growing Communities Fund. That's a billion dollars going directly to local governments and regional districts. Um, and uh, the biggest beneficiary of that fund, because it uses adjusted population as well as population growth, is the city of Surrey. Um, we announced the amount today, uh, $90 million going to the city of Surrey to respond to the unique, the mayor's like, <laughs> Mayor Locke. <laughs> 
I appreciate that applause, Mayor Locke. It's our partnership, right, to deliver for the people of Surrey. And it doesn't matter if it's roads and sidewalks or uh, uh, swimming pools or community centers. We announced the fund at a beautiful uh, swimming pool. People need those opportunities, but also that critical infrastructure that's strained by growth, the water treatment plants and so on, uh, that keep the city moving and keep business moving are critically important as well. This matters for business. It matters for business because the easier it is to move goods, uh, the better it is for your business. The more amenities Surrey has to offer, the easier it is to attract employees and the more that other people will be drawn to the city to patronize your businesses. Uh, it, Surrey, we know, is growing into a central hub for the region where people want to live, work, and shop. We want to support that with this fund. And so that growth and how we can accelerate that together, that contributes to your success as a city as well. As business leaders, I know that you know that affordable housing is key for recruiting and retaining a skilled workforce. Housing, one of the biggest challenges you've told us that you face, uh, skilled, trades, skilled training for people as well, um, a big challenge. We hear you. Housing is crucial to our economy. It's central infrastructure. It's like power lines. It's like sewers. Without housing, our communities cannot be successful. Uh, that's why our new housing plan, uh, which launches next month, will be backed by $4.2 billion in this year's budget. We're going to build more homes for middle-income families, for renters, and uh, students, and more. Uh, one of the key uh, focuses of this plan, as well, is to build housing near transit. With our SkyTrain investment in the Surrey-Langley SkyTrain, we're buying the properties around the stations so that we can develop them and provide housing for people that actually use transit close to transit. We also know that it's not just about money. Uh, we have to clear the way for more housing across the province, not every city is like Surrey, across the province with zoning changes and a faster permitting process. But we're not just pointing the finger at municipalities. We're pointing the finger at ourselves too. We've got to do better on permits. Uh, and so uh, we're uh, focusing our permit reform. The, the start of the permit reform uh, is focused on housing. Uh, making sure that at the provincial level we're approving housing as quickly as possible. We're also legislating housing targets for municipalities to match our population growth, to recognize the essential nature of housing as infrastructure, that it is a provincial responsibility to ensure there's enough housing built for the people who are coming to our province. Now I'm sitting uh, beside Todd, uh, and uh, he and I have had many conversations about uh, his frustration, and I'm sure a shared frustration, with the permitting process generally in the province. Uh, we need to remove those barriers to growth uh, that we have in BC. Um, by fixing permit delays, it doesn't matter if it's in natural resources, in the development of industrial sites, in tourism, in housing. Uh, we know that a project, a home, a job creating site that only exists in a permit application on someone's desk doesn't do us any good at all. We need to get shovels in the ground. We need to get to work. This year's budget has 160 new staff that are going to do two things. One is they're going to help us chew through the backlog. Uh, the remarkable pace of economic activity in our province has meant growing backlogs at the provincial level that we need to deal with. But we also recognize that we have a systems problem. There are permit requirements for things that make absolutely no sense. I could uh, give you horror stories. I'm sure you have them around the table about ditches subject to the Water Sustainability Act, uh, about uh, the requirements. We were just talking about requirements around uh, uh, sampling for contaminated sites. We need to maintain high standards. We need to protect our water. We need to protect our people. But we also need to make sure that it makes sense and that our uh, requirements are practical. And so uh, they will be reforming the system as well. We also recognize that uh, very few projects, especially major projects now, can go ahead without a strong partnership with First Nations. We have increasing obligations through courts, through treaties, but also self-imposed through the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act that we adopted provincially to engage with First Nations partners uh, across the province. And we know that there is a challenge with capacity. Nations are getting permit applications showing up over and over uh, into their office and they're like, who are the staff who are going to help deal with this? So you will see announcements from us about how we're inc increasing capacity for First Nations to be able to be actual partners at the table, government to government, so we can get these projects moving. I am committed to this path. We're going to get it done.
Um, I want to talk about health. I think that uh, Surrey is really on the front lines of some of the challenges that we're seeing in the healthcare system. Uh, and uh, challenges, by the way, that are national in scope. I was with uh, all of the premiers from the provinces and territories uh, uh, working with the federal government. And the stories of crisis across uh, Canada are very consistent. Um, in our budget uh, this year, almost $6.4 billion to improve healthcare in our province. This is a recognition of a couple of things. Um, first of all, uh, that we need to ensure that our healthcare system is just keeping up with the growth that we're seeing, but also that there are areas where we need to expand the services that we have available. So there's a new BC Cancer Care Plan, which is a, a plan that's focused on prevention and early detection to keep costs down, but also when people do face that cancer diagnosis that they get the treatment that they need when they need it urgently. This funding will support the major cancer care site that's going to be built into the new Surrey Hospital, meaning people don't have to travel outside of the community to get care. Uh, but it also includes funding to recognize another key part of the challenge, which is that our pandemic-stressed healthcare staff, the understaffing in our hospitals that has come from that, uh, uh, is only solved if we get more people into our healthcare system to provide that relief. So we are funding our healthcare workforce with thousands of new training seats. We know that, uh, that BC doctors and nurses uh, need world-class facilities to provide the best care. So we've invested over $570 million in the Surrey Memorial Hospital since 2017. That's why we're building the new hospital in Surrey. And by the way, construction is starting this summer, for those of you who are as anxious as I am to see the shovels in the ground there. There's another uh, uh, impact that we've seen coming out of the pandemic, uh, which is that people uh, have a sense that their downtowns are not the same, uh, that uh, they see people struggling with mental health and addiction. They're concerned about safety issues uh, in our community. And what's happening now isn't working for anybody in many communities, uh, not for the people who are suffering in our streets, and certainly not for business owners and staff who are affected by this. And we've done some good work in partnership with Surrey to address uh, some serious uh, issues that you have faced in your community, but there's lots more work to do. Um, so we have dedicated in this budget a billion dollars of that health care money for an expansion of mental health and addiction treatment services in our province. <laughs> this funding is for a couple of things. It's for youth. So youth who are struggling with addiction and mental health, we intervene early to save them from a lifetime of suffering. This is about intervening for people who are in the streets, struggling now uh, with overdose, with brain injuries caused by overdose, with mental health, uh, by expanding the Redfish Center for Care, which is on the Riverview lands in Coquitlam. Uh, it's a model that treats mental health and addiction at the same time, expanding that model regionally. Uh, it's about increasing uh, the number of beds available uh, uh, that uh, for people who need residential treatment uh, across the province, including a new model of care at St. Paul's Hospital where people uh, will enter the emergency room with overdose and then will be able to go directly into detox, directly into treatment, right on site at the hospital without leaving so that we don't lose them when they have that moment of clarity and they want to get, they want to turn their lives around. But it's also about four, uh, initially four sites in the province of community recovery centers because once people have dealt with the physical aspects of addiction, uh, the, the mental peace can live on. They need community, they need connection to housing, they need connection to job training, and they need connection to employment as well as a recovery community to help them stay strong and support them if they slip. And so uh, four different centers across the province to support them. Um, on uh, moving away from mental health and addiction into, into crime directly, uh, we have a Safer Communities Action Plan. Um, part of that is focused on getting violent repeat offenders off of our streets. Uh, we uh, have uh, pushed the federal government to agree to change the criminal code to address these issues, uh, but we're not waiting. We're funding teams of uh, prosecutors, police, probation officers uh, to work together to identify those offenders and do everything possible to keep them in custody. Um, for organized crime, we, we recently won our case at the Court of Appeal, where our government seized the Hells Angels clubhouses in British Columbia. Um, absolutely. 
Um, and uh, our government is also going to be bringing in unexplained wealth orders. I don't think there's anything more frustrating to British Columbians, or at least to me, around law and order and law enforcement. People operating openly as members of organized crime, with luxury cars, with real estate, uh, with no apparent legitimate source of income. Uh, and the same goes for corrupt officials from around the world who think that they can hide their assets in British Columbia. Uh, an unexplained wealth order requires them to prove that they have a legitimate source of income, and if they can't, then we can seize their assets. And by seizing their assets, we take away that incentive for young people to think organized crime is something that they should get involved in. Uh, and we're going to use the money to fund anti-gang programs, as long, along with uh, safer community programs in our province. So uh, one of the things we have been listening, one of the things we've heard from you, one of the challenges you faced is finding skilled workers to take the jobs that you have available. Uh, ac access to workers and talent is one of the major challenges we've heard from you about, and, and we do face a serious challenge ahead. Uh, we are told that we will have over a million job openings in our province over the next 10 years. Our government is responding to this need. We talked about childcare, we talked about housing, but we also have a skilled training program. We're setting aside $480 million to make sure that people uh, can access the training they need, both to move up from a low wage job to a higher wage, higher skilled job through grants so that they can do training uh, without, uh, without being unable to pay their rent, uh, to attract new talent by speeding up the recognition of international credentials. People have experience in other places in the world, whether it's healthcare workers or teachers or others struggling to get that recognized in British Columbia, despite having all the skills we need. We've got $58 million set aside to support the uh, colleges to get credentials recognized, uh, but also to support newcomers as well. Um, there's, a, there's an array of initiatives, and I can't wait to share more details with you about Future Ready in the coming weeks. Um, all budgets are about choices. There's no question about that. And our government has been making the choices uh, to grow a, a cleaner and stronger economy by investing in people. Um, and but one of the, um, the pieces that I believe very strongly is that we can't do it on our own. Uh, we do require a strong partnership with business, with people in this room, with local governments, and with First Nations. And so I also want you to know that we're listening. I'm here to listen, and our government is committed to work with you. When you say there's an issue with permits, we're going to address permits. When you say there's an issue finding skilled workers, we're going to address that. The Surrey Board of Trade and other business organizations in our province are a key source of information for us about how we build a stronger province together, one where you can afford a decent home, where you can feel safe in your community, where you have access to a family doctor, where your kids are learning in great schools and businesses can thrive. We have that shared vision. I know there's a lot of work ahead of us, uh, but I'm always listening, and I can't wait to hear from you uh, because we've got a lot of work to do together. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Premier. So everyone, this is a man of action. He's been labeled as a man of action. He's our first Gen X Premier. Uh, so we're looking forward to some innovation for our economy. So now is the time for the Premier to listen to you. If you have a question, please go to the microphone, state your name, your organization or company name, and your question very succinctly. Go ahead. <laughs> Anita, for that subtle cue. Um, I'm Gerard Bramo, uh, Mr. Premier. Thank you for joining us in Surrey. And I'm a past chair of the Board of Trade, as Anita teased me a little bit earlier about. And I want to acknowledge, as a past chair, the terrific work of this Surrey Board of Trade advancing child care as a national issue. It's here in Surrey that that genesis occurred at a national level. So thank you, Anita. Thank you to the Board of Trade for that. And as you said, uh, Mr. Premier, and thank you for your closing remarks about listening. Uh, sincerely, um, the Center for Child Development, of which I am the CEO, uh, is celebrating its 70th anniversary this year. Mm -hmm. And we serve 4,000 children with developmental disabilities throughout the South Fraser region. I'm also proud to be a member of the SFU Community Advisory Council, the Healthy Community Partnership, and numerous other community bodies. Why? Because exactly what you said, Mr. Prager, is we have a significant gap between what we are doing right now and what we need to do. There are some 30,000 children 
and youth with disabilities. In our region, we need our help. We're at roughly 10% of capacity to provide that service. Sophie's Place, that we're so proud to partner with the City of Surrey, and thank you, Madam Mayor, and all of Council through successive councils for all their support, served 300 children last year who experienced physical abuse and sexual assault. Hmm. And we know that there's a vast need there, and there's a tremendous need for growth. As you look to the future, I thank you for the support through this year's budget for $95 million worth of consultation over three years to child development centers across the province on these topics. And I ask you, uh, Mr. Premier, as you look forward to that consultation and growth and expansion of services in these areas, appreciate all the support in child care, all the support in housing, and it's music to my ears to hear your support in health care and with SFU's new medical school. Uh, as you look to these consultations, expansion for children and youth with developmental disabilities, we'd love your thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Green. Great. Thanks very much. Um, great question, and thanks for all your work and, uh, and your past work with the uh, Surrey Board of Trade and your current work with all these boards and organizations. Um, for the Center for Child uh, Development and uh, like organizations, um, there is a commitment uh, by the minister, by me, uh, to work with you uh, about the gap. So we have, uh, if your child has an autism diagnosis, uh, we have uh, individualized funding program. Uh, but there's a bunch of kids that don't fit into that box that need s similar supports. Uh, their parents need support, they're fa facing a huge amount of strain, and those kids are the ones uh, that we're uh, particularly worried about. Now, we had an issue uh, where uh, parents of kids with autism were facing a huge amount of stress, they were concerned about government's direction, uh, and we have reassured them that they don't need to worry about their individualized funding, we're gonna continue that. But for the parents of kids that don't fit into that category, that don't get that diagnosis, they're like, what about us? Um, so that money is not just for engagement, it's also for pilot projects across the province uh, to deliver care uh, in a different way, uh, and we're hopeful uh, to see some positive results from that uh, in, uh, in community uh, uh, settings across British Columbia. Um, but we're going in uh, with a, uh, a research orientation uh, to evaluate the effectiveness of this particular kind of approach, uh, and uh, an open partnership we've had to reset because of the challenges we had around the autism funding. We had to reset our relationship, and my instructions to the minister to reset that relationship with service provider organizations and build trust so that we're all working together. Uh, and that's been with First Nations advocates and with uh, child-serving uh, organization advocates like you. Um, I uh, am actually going to be meeting with uh, a significant number of these organizations uh, in the next couple of weeks uh, to hear from them directly about how we can build that relationship further. Uh, the minister will be joining me there. Um, I want them to know, I want the parents to know, I want the kids to know that our government's committed uh, to doing things right on this file because we have that shared goal of supporting families, supporting kids, uh, and, uh, and we're increasing funding funding in this area, so let's get outcomes that support everybody. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prima uh, Welcome to Surrey, and thank you, Anita, for the visit of any of the Surrey Board of Trade. Uh, you know, I lived in Surrey since uh, 1972, and then I was chair of Surrey Board of Trade back in 96, 97, and then served as the MLA from 2001 to 2013. And uh, one thing I found was uh, one of the best announcements your government made was eliminating the tolls in Portland Bridge, and mm -hmm. that shifted uh, mm -hmm. the brought your government in the power, NDP government in power. Mm -hmm. And uh, sadly enough, uh, probably 2013, 2017, not enough funds were put in Surrey, mm -hmm. and uh, these liberals lost the power, and NDP came in. Mm -hmm. So we really appreciate all the announcements you have made. So far, they just announced a couple of things. One is like a solar bridge. You know, it was built about when we didn't have that many cars, uh, it was four lanes, and now after 60 years or so later, we're building it again four lanes. I think it, you should really take a look at it, maybe making the eight, eight lane, four lanes each way. Mm -hmm. And I have said to your transportation minister when he spoke at the border trade last time. Uh, other one is uh, back in 2006, Premier uh, Gordon Campbell promised with SFU Surrey he will double the full time equivalent spaces at Surrey campus. Mm -hmm. They were needed in 2006. Now, 2023, not we only need a double, we probably need triple. And I have mentioned to you when you came to Surrey to announce about uh, Surrey, the new, uh, new um, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, education train a, a, a new uh, medical school for Surrey. And then I said, look, uh, not only do we need the medical school, it is behind, but we also need for you to commit maybe making it tripling the spaces of full-time children for SFU Surrey mm -hmm. and Toronto University. Can you take a look at those two? And I want to thank you all for the announcement. And these are probably two things that maybe you can look at uh, as a new premier. Uh, maybe, and I have mentioned this all you MLAs and ministers from here locally over the last five, six years too. Hopefully they won't talk to you. I know Gary has been uh, talking to me regularly on this. Uh, maybe you can make an announcement here. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, thanks, Dave. Uh, all great points. Um, we're committed to getting uh, people and goods traveling uh, in, uh, in Surrey uh, more efficiently and uh, right up the valley, uh, which is why we're um, uh, expanding Highway 1, why we're doing Surrey Langley SkyTrain, uh, and, uh, and thank you for the suggestion uh, on the bridge. Um, we're going to continue to do that work, uh, and our Ministry of Transportation is committed to make sure that people spend less time in traffic and more time at home with their families, uh, and, uh, and that they're able to get to work. Um, the, on the specific question about, uh, about training spaces, I can tell you that uh, the Future Ready um, uh, Skills Money will fund uh, thousands of new training seats for key in-demand uh, areas. Uh, we've already increased, for example, the number of nursing spaces, uh, including at KPU, uh, 600 new nursing spaces. Uh, I was there just uh, yesterday with the Prime Minister. Uh, visiting, was that yesterday? Man, time. Uh, 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 thank you. Uh, just yesterday with the Prime Minister visiting uh, students who were, uh, who were doing training there. Um, we're uh, also increasing funding for, among other things, early childhood educators, uh, healthcare workers like nurses and care aides, uh, and tech workers as well. Um, but also uh, skilled trades training um, to be able to build uh, our province and build our future. Uh, um, and, uh, and we have uh, all along the Surrey uh, SkyTrain line, for example, uh, there will be uh, uh, apprentices who are learning uh, skilled trades on those sites. Uh, and uh, they'll be from uh, groups that have been very underrepresented in skilled trades, uh, women, indigenous people, people of color, uh, learning, welding, electrical skills, and other skills, and they will be not from uh, a thousand miles away, they'll be from Surrey. And when they finish those skills, when they build that apprenticeship on that project, they'll be in the community ready to build uh, for Surrey going forward. So we're looking at how do we use infrastructure uh, to increase the number of skill training opportunities, as well as directly funding that work as well. Um, thanks, Dave, for that important question. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Cole Isaac. I'm a recovering addict, and I am the founder and director of uh, Back on Track Recovery, which was established about 10 years ago here in Surrey. Um, thank you for being here, uh, here and taking our questions and, and hearing our comments. Um, I have uh, 80 clients. Uh, most of my clients come from the streets and homelessness or the correctional uh, system, and I am tasked with um, supporting and feeding and providing shelter to these clients um, and troubled youth. Um, and I received funding of $35 per day. Um, I've asked that we revisit this with the Ministry of Social Development. You cannot um, kennel a dog for $35 a day. And yet I have to feed them. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a challenge for me to do. It's not even feasible. I have to um, seek other sources and fundraising, all kinds of things, just to be able to feed them properly. So we need to take a look at that. I understand that we're going to increase our beds. Um, Surrey is doing so much more than her share in terms of recovery houses and, and the, re the right response. It's, it's something that our city should wear as a badge of honor. Uh, there are no other cities in this country that are doing what Surrey does, but we can do better and we should do better. And just because we are doing enough doesn't mean that we cannot do more. Great. Thanks, Cole. Um, thanks, Cole. I, uh, I find like peop that uh, people uh, like you who have lived uh, and are living in recovery uh, are the real advocates and champions of the work that we need to do. And thank you for raising this important issue. Um, the uh, uh, plan that we have around expanding the number of beds as well as outpatient treatment is not 
um, uh, focused on one particular model of delivering care. So we're working with the Canadian Mental Health Association, who are partnering with nonprofit organizations uh, to expand beds. Uh, we're working with hospitals. Uh, we're working with First Nations. There is a category, though, uh, that has not been explicitly covered, which is the category you're talking about, which are recovery houses. Um, we have had a challenge in the past with recovery houses around the uh, inconsistent standards. Some are really high quality. Some are not. Uh, and, uh, and the opportunity for us, I think, uh, is uh, linking any increase in funding, any increased support with uh, commitments around standards, which Cole, it sounds like your organization. I, I don't know your organization. I'd love to visit, actually, um, to see what you're up to. Um, but I agree with you. Um, we can't leave any, it's, it's a lot like housing. We can't leave any opportunities on the table to open up housing. We can't leave any opportunities on the table to open up support for people struggling with addiction. It's a crisis. We have people who are dying, uh, and we want to support it. So uh, Cole, I look forward to working with you. I'll, I'll raise the issue again with the Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. I know, uh, I know she's aware of it, but, uh, but we'll follow up on that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Vandana, and I represent Western Community College. It's a private designated college in Surrey. So first of all, thank you, Premier, for sharing your vision with us, especially, and thank you, Anita, for organizing this and inviting us. Uh, so well, one question I want to ask, like, why private colleges are not getting that much encouragement from the government? Because they do a lot of contribution. So recently, uh, through the community workforce grants, we were able to contribute to the healthcare field, and we graduated, you know, hundreds of uh, students, and they became healthcare assistants, and they were helping at the time when it was needed the most. But what we hear in the mandate is like, okay, private colleges are offering substandard education, or you know, government needs to have an eye on that. I agree, there are a few colleges doing that. But why, like, everyone is painted in the same color, and why we don't get the same support as public colleges? For example, we want to contribute to. I'm so glad we are raising, removing those bars for the internationally educated nurses by you know, credential evaluation process. But at the same time, we need to graduate more nurses. And for that, we need affiliation agreements for practical placements with Fraser Health. We are on the wait list with Fraser Health for more than seven years now, ready with the program to go, but just an affiliation agreement is required for practical placement, and we will be able to graduate nurses every year to contribute to the field which needs it the most. That's right. Well, thanks. That's a great question. Um, and thanks for bringing that opportunity forward. Um, I think that any time uh, we're talking about direct government funding of private institutions, um, we are a bit uh, cautious about it because our public institutions are in need of significant funding, uh, whether it's private schools, uh, elementary or secondary, or um, in relation to uh, post-secondary. Uh, but if you have suggestions about how um, uh, your school could place students uh, in Fraser Health or in other places, I'd, absolutely want to hear about them. Uh, we, again, are looking for every opportunity we can uh, to train people up, to give them experience, and to support healthcare workers on site. Uh, and it's not an ideological approach. Uh, we're looking for opportunities that, uh, that you may offer. So um, I would be glad to hear more about that. Uh, James, actually, who is sitting immediately to your right, um, feel free to give him uh, your information and we'll follow up on that, uh, on that issue with, uh, with Fraser Health as well as other suggestions you might have. Um, and, uh, but I do want to say uh, in this room um, that uh, I'm hearing serious concerns about uh, labor market assessment uh, sales, uh, frankly, um, about bad actors. Uh, in relation to uh, international students, temporary uh, workers, and others. Uh, and, uh, and I welcome your suggestions on this issue. How can government uh, go after that effectively uh, and address this issue? We want people who are coming to British Columbia to have a positive experience here. We want them to see us as a jurisdiction uh, where uh, there are avenues for them to seek help and support and that they feel supported because whether they stay in British Columbia or whether they go home, uh, to, uh, to wherever they were coming from, we want them to maintain that relationship with our province. Uh, and, uh, and that helps us build business, that helps us build trade, and that helps us build our province. So um, suggestions are also welcome on that. If you're working with a lot of international students, um, if you have suggestions about how we support them, protect them, advance their interests, and build a strong relationship with BC, I want to hear that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. much. Next, please. Thank you so much. So my name is Dylan Hancock. Uh, thank you so much, Premier Evie, for taking up the questions. Hi, Dylan. Uh, I represent institutions in Canada and overseas. I've been working in private education for a long while, and uh, I have connections with institutions in Dubai, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Malaysia, and whatnot, who have all nursing programs. Hmm. 
I was very interested to see about the priority that we're doing for recognition of credentials for international universities, but I'd love to have more clarity about what is the strategy that BC is going to be doing. I know Manitoba has been very aggressive going to other countries like the Philippines to recruit nurses directly right to the hospitals, mm -hmm. um, subject to a couple of changes here and there. But my question is more like, what is the specifics of what BC is doing for this credential recognition? Mm -hmm. What is the plan that's going to be implemented? Is there a timeline? And what is the scale that we can do? Myself, I used to be, uh, I could provide a couple thousand nurses from institutions around the world who are all saying, I want to come to Canada, I want to come to BC, but how? Mm. Great question. Thanks, Dylan. Uh, so there are two aspects to the to this issue. One is people who are located um, overseas that want to come, or another country that want to come to British Columbia, and so the immigration uh, question of how they get their visas and how they get uh, certified to be able to work in British Columbia. Uh, I've spoken with the federal government about this. They assure us that they are prepared to build a direct uh, uh, line for us to recruit uh, needed healthcare workers through our provincial nominee program. Uh, which is great news. Uh, so we're working with them on that. Uh, the second aspect is, uh, can we get people, especially given the length of time of processing at the federal level, can we get people started on certification before they arrive? Um, and so working with the colleges on, um, on uh, uh, identifying particular countries where they can certify certain programs, that if people do it, uh, do those programs that they're ready to go when they hit the ground in British Columbia, as opposed to landing in British Columbia and then having to be evaluated, having to find work for that period when they're going through evaluation. Um, the specifics on what we've done so far around credential recognition, we have about 2,000 nurses in the queue with the College of Nurses. Uh, there's 3,000 more that we know are interested in coming to British Columbia. The wait time was two to three years to get through that assessment process. Uh, and then um, uh, be able to know what education they had to do to do that education and then to get certified by the college. Uh, we've worked with the college to get that down to nine months uh, and there, our target is three months. Um, and so uh, they're, they're doing that work uh, to push uh, those assessments through faster. Um, and the other pieces, uh, we were told there's a financial barrier that was facing people, and this was for BC nurses that maybe took some time off and wanted to come back, as well as international nurses. So we've waived all of the upfront charges, the assessment charge, the exam charge, the, all the fees that the regulator was charging. Uh, we have bursaries uh, for nurses for their training, um, and uh, all of it aimed at, at getting nurses to work. When I visit um, uh, India and the Philippines, I'll be visiting nursing uh, colleges as well, with the, hopefully with the college, we're working out the details on that, uh, so we can talk about um, uh, what the education standards are and so that the college has more confidence about what's happening in those communities, in those countries, and the, the nurses who want to come to British Columbia. So uh, I'd love to hear more from you about uh, countries that may not be on our radar experience. It sounds like you have and opportunities that you see, so please, um, please stay in touch with us. Thanks very much, Dylan. Thank you so much. Okay. Final two questions from the audience. Oh, nice to see you here. My name is Arthur from Melbourne School. We Hi, Arthur. We talked about last year about housing market about Sunco, if you remember. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions I have is the one of the challenge, challenges we have in business in Surrey is the big up industrial space. Mm. Right now we don't have a lot of industrial land overall from I mean, this race from where our place is been going to the oil and ship on. I believe a lot of people from BD will know about that. Mm -hmm. I think this is sort of challenging we are facing. And given that last year, I believe, that the uh, commercial land was resumed as a residential, despite the story of the trace against it. So my question would be, what is our plan to protect and even looking for more spaces a welcome from industrial warehouse or other commercial use? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Arthur. The shortage of industrial land is a serious issue, and, um, and part of it uh, is due to the fact that we have the agricultural land reserve. Um, I think that in, uh, in other uh, places, uh, the agricultural land reserve would already be a, a sea of warehouses. Um, so in, uh, in some respects, it's working really well, and it's still farmland, but in some respects, it's not. Um, in particular, uh, around the agricultural land reserve, uh, there are lots of food processing businesses uh, and food warehousing businesses uh, that are locating on industrial land because they can't go to other places. Um, we have also had in, uh, food processors, uh, processors that are processing food from British Columbia 
go outside of British Columbia because they can't find the space for, uh, for chicken processing, for example. A polite euphemism, but in any way, chicken processing, uh, which happens in Alberta uh, instead of in British Columbia. And one of the things we learned during COVID was how uh, significant it is when the border closes or during the atmospheric river when the highways close uh, between us and Alberta, uh, issue of food security becomes very front of mind. So uh, I've asked our agriculture minister in her mandate letter uh, to work with, uh, um, in particular, uh, people who want to process BC food, uh, how we can better use the agricultural land reserve to recognize it as a food security reserve, rather than um, exclusively, um, you can only process food from your own farm, for example. Um, so I know there are a lot of sensitivities around this and we want to do it right, uh, but taking some of that pressure off industrial land where food processors and, uh, and food uh, wholesalers have to locate on industrial land uh, is one part. The other part is um, there are opportunities to expand industrial land uh, that are held up in various permitting and, uh, and other kind of processes uh, that are delaying things. And so um, that's part of what our permitting uh, piece is about as well. Um, it's not something we're gonna solve overnight. We're a land constrained in the lower mainland and by choice uh, around protecting uh, food security. But we, when we see California with droughts and fires and, and knowing the volume of produce we import from California to feed British Columbians, uh, we need to make sure that we're, uh, we're producing food, uh, not just for domestic, but also for international export as well. Huge opportunities for us that I'll be raising when I'm overseas as well. So. Um, so so uh, definitely aware of it, definitely working on it, and thank you very much, Arthur, for raising the issue. Okay, this will be the final two questions from the audience. <laughs> thank you so much for all the announcements. We're so excited in Surrey to hear everything. I just want to thank Mayor and Council for the generous donation to Surrey Crime Prevention. I, um, through our grant, I'm the Executive Director of Surrey Crime Prevention. We have over 520 volunteers, all university and high school students that support our programs. We're very unique in 10 years. We've contributed over 275,000 hours to the city. Wow. I was recently approached by an organization who's struggling, and they have uh, youth who are assigned court-appointed hours. As a result of very limited opportunities, they've come to us. And as a result of our programs, they're now participating in that. But without funding, we can't continue that, that opportunity. Mm. So they are out there removing graffiti throughout the city, learning some value about civic pride. But I just wanted to extend a, an invitation to the government to explore why courts are so disconnected with the, uh, assigning court-appointed hours to youth when there's very few opportunities out there. Hmm. That's something that was brought to my attention through an organization. I have one other point I want to make. In the past eight years, I've, over, I've taken care of my mother's needs who is a, um, she recently passed away, she had dementia, and we were able to get CECL funding, Choice for Support for Independent Living. I didn't hear anything today about seniors, and I wanted to ex extend an invitation to share on the from the government's perspective what they're doing for seniors. Keeping seniors at home mm -hmm. through the CECL program was the most valuable thing we could have done for my mom. And I sponsored two nurses from the Philippines to come here and look after her through that program. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, without that program, she would have been an institution and deteriorated really quick. So I just want to ask what the government's going to be doing to maybe expand that opportunity to families. Because everybody in this room, we're all getting old. <laughs> and we all have families that are getting old. And I'll tell you, that program was absolutely the best thing for our family. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, and uh, absolutely. So uh, we have a rapidly aging population in British Columbia, which is part of what our cancer announcement was about. Um, but we know that we're gonna need uh, long-term care support. Uh, we have 21 long-term care um, buildings uh, that are under development across the province right now. Uh, but um, if we can have people stay at home longer, as your, was it your experience with your mom, if we can support them to be at home longer, it's good news for everybody, it takes pressure off the hospitals, takes pressure off long-term care, uh, and so on. So uh, part of our uh, 6.2 billion in the healthcare system is about expanding uh, home care supports. Now, I don't know if it's specifically targeted to that program, better at home, what the breakdown is, and, and so on, but we can get you that information. Um, but the, the goal is to take pressure off our hospitals by keeping people 
people out of the hospitals, whether if they need to go to long-term care, they get into a long-term care bed, or if they can be looked after at home with, uh, with medical support rather than in a hospital bed, they're more comfortable, it's better for everybody, it's cheaper. Um, it's uh, one of the key priority areas uh, in the bilateral agreement with the federal government, home care and long-term care. Uh, to, for that exact reason. And so thank you for sharing your experience. I agree with you. This is a, a critically important opportunity. And thanks for the reminder about that specific program. I hadn't thought about it for a while, and, uh, and I'll follow up on that. Thank you. Go ahead. My name's Gurveer Sara of Hi. TM Crest Holmes. Hello. A local developer in Surrey. Uh, I'd like to thank you for joining us at this event to uh, take our questions. Uh, my father uh, worked 20 years in uh, the McMillan Blodell Lumber Mill in Port Alberni. Uh, he started developing homes in Surrey in the mid 1980s. And so I've sort of been raised in this business. And I was like wondering if you could speak to more about the permitting that you're discussing, how it's going to be a bit more streamlined, or what changes, or exactly how are these changes going to be enacted. I could go over just a couple of the examples of ways that our developments have been <laughs> i'm sure all developers have the same concerns but like i've had line type or font on a drawing being brought up you know at the last moment that could that caused delays or you know a, a landscape plan sitting on you know a, a planning employee's desk for eight ten months without it being looked at um, minutia of some of the drawings, it, it really is like, it's, I feel like it's, it's like a weight on like the whole industry. Mm. And just wondering what is some of the details of your plan of permitting? Sure. Yeah, thanks. Great question. So uh, on the provincial side, uh, for our permits, uh, and for those of you that aren't in industry, I apologize for those of you that are in industry and you're like, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, Ministry of Transportation, has a lot uh, to do with uh, major new housing developments in terms of road and highway access. Anything that's within a certain distance of a highway, for example. Uh, the Ministry of Forests around Water Sustainability Act permits. If you have uh, sometimes even a, just a ditch with water in it, uh, you are suddenly within the Water Sustainability Act <laughs> framework. Um, we also have the uh, Ministry of Energy and Mines. Uh, many developments require gravel pits in order to be able to uh, provide gravel needed for the development, especially in, uh, in uh, smaller centers across the province. Uh, and when you put all of it together um, at the provincial level, you may be dealing with several different uh, contacts within several different ministries, uh, all of which may be asking you contradictory things. Uh, and asking for different information this over and over and over again in slightly different ways. Uh, it drives people crazy. So I'm going to focus on the provincial. Uh, we are going to have a single window uh, access for housing where you come in and you only have one point of contact with the provincial government. Uh, we are going to have a dashboard available so that you can see what the permit approval times are uh, for various permits that are required. So it's transparent to you and people know we're making progress driving those numbers down. Uh, we are bringing in additional staff to reduce uh, permit times uh, and to fix our internal processes so it's not just a single window up front, that we actually have a unified process behind the window as well. That'll take some time given all the silos in different ministries uh, so that the same information is used uh, uh, consistently. That's housing on the provincial side. But on the municipal side, um, our focus is really around how do we support municipalities in, uh, in predetermining what is allowed on sites as opposed to waiting for the application and then rezoning afterwards so that there's a community plan uh, and then the zoning is consistent with the community plan. Uh, so in, uh, in uh, some countries, uh, you can just enter uh, with an open source data uh, your architectural drawings on a particular site and they will tell you automatically uh, what is compliant and what is not compliant with the building code, uh, what is allowed to be built on that site, uh, and, uh, and you can get, in some cases, instant approval for your building. It is remarkable what's happening around the world. So we want to work with municipalities on that. But we also want to align the interests of the builder with the interests of the city. So we have set uh, new legislation, it was one of the first pieces of legislation passed after I became Premier, I was working on it as Minister of Housing, uh, to uh, give the province the ability to legislate targets, the number of units of different kinds of housing that a municipality needs to approve in a year. 
and, uh, and to work with the cities to deliver that. Uh, so that um, the legislation says if the city doesn't deliver those units, the province can step in and zone sites for that housing. It's based on legislation out of the United States and other jurisdictions. And the goal isn't that the province comes in and does that. The goal is that the province and the city and the builders are aligned. We need to get these housing units built. We want to get them built. That it has that uh, component where the province could step in, but it also has the carrots too. The Growing Community Fund recognizes those communities like Surrey that have been approving housing that have been growing quickly in terms of population to help build the infrastructure and make things better. So we're going to put those two things together. If you're meeting and exceeding your targets, you get access to more funding and support. If you're not, the province is going to step in and make sure that that happens in your community. Um, because again, this is essential infrastructure for our province. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Premier, a third of Surrey's population is under the age of 19, and actually there's just one more question from the audience <laughs> related sorry. to that. I was hesitant earlier, but I said I have to come up. Fantastic. Thank you so Good. much for your time. Uh, thank you, Anita, for doing this for us. Um, my name is Karen. I'm with an organization called Kids Play Foundation. Um, I take my role very seriously, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I'm up here today. We work with a lot of children, youth that are uh, facing mental health issues, they've got uh, dysfunctional families, they come from the most broken homes. Mm. And then I see that there's, you know, big buildings being made and, you know, the city is being developed, which is so, so important. But if we're not gonna do anything for these kids, then who's going to be looking after these huge facilities? Um, I'm just gonna give you a quick example of a 15 year old. Uh, back in November, he was kicked out of school um, and he was labeled as one of the most notorious kids and they didn't want him anywhere near the classrooms, which made sense because he showed up to school with a BB gun. Um, and once we were told about him, it was his mom who was crying on the phone and said, I'm, I'm done with my boy, just take him away. Um, later on, he came on, uh, volunteered for one day in November, uh, one more day in December, and January he's been with us every other day. Um, in December, his school reached out and said he is now no longer allowed to be in our particular school. He's going to have to go to a neighboring district or into a whole other city. And uh, when we sat him down and we told him that the only way we can help him is if he tells us what is it that's bothering him so much. Why can't he be in school, you know, just do his homework and, and go back home, play some sports and go to bed. Why does he need to be getting out and getting into fights? That's when we realized that his dad was battling uh, with mental health and from alcohol he became a hard drug addict. Uh, he was probably the most loving father, and this is what the boy and the mom tells us, however his addiction got the best of him. And there are many different layers that go into this particular problem, but soon after the dad took off, both the older sisters, because of the abuse they had a dear, they left the home. Mm. Now it's a 15 year old with this mom, what do you expect of this boy? He's fully French immersion, he's 97 percentile math. He's an intelligent kid, but fingers are pointed at him because there's lots of loopholes. We need to help these kids out, we need to be there for them. And the only reason he comes to Kids Play day after day is because first his mom made, me, made him. Secondly, because he realized we're gonna watch out for him. And that is the reason he comes out. Just two weeks ago he told me, he said, Karen, the only reason I came out was because of basketball because I thought you guys would provide me with, you know, a basketball team and I'd, I'd do some sports, make my mom happy, do my thing. But he goes, now I met some guys and I think I'm gonna be okay. Hmm. But this is just one of many stories. I can tell you tons and tons, and there's many nonprofits in this room that do a lot of good work. But at the end of the day, uh, the only request and appeal I have is I'm very privileged to stand here. Many of my peers didn't make it. Many of them are heavily involved in gangs and drugs. I have a cousin who's been in jail for the last six years. Um, and so it could have been me. It's as simple as that could have been any one of us. But just because we were privileged, we have the opportunities, we have the support, it's only fair if we pay it forward together. And I think it's not only your job, but it's our job in this room to do better. Mm. So um, anything we can do to help with these kids and families, I know these politicians, everybody, they, they try to do their best, I think, but it's, it's high time we come together as a community. Time and time again, we are failing these kids. They're actually victims. We can't be pointing fingers at them. They're 12, they're 11, they're being caught with vapes, they're being caught with drugs. Well, who's supplying it? How are they getting it? Mm -hmm. Why is it that I get to live in a beautiful home and this kid in a small basement? Mm -hmm. Why is it that 
our buildings are massive and beautiful, which they should be, don't get me wrong, but why are these schools with broken roofs? Mm -hmm. I, I'm unable to understand that we're investing so much, which as we should, in these large buildings and, and corporations and all sorts of work, but when I walk into a school to speak to a principal and I see massive holes in the walls or if I see the roofs, it, it just doesn't add up. Maybe it's just me, maybe I'm naive to it, maybe I don't understand it, but at the same time, I think it's our responsibility to just to do a little bit better because I'm telling you, these kids are dying. Mm. And these are kids' lives we're talking about. Mm. And um, when I look at them, I look at um, how unfortunate it is that we're continuing to fail. And it is very difficult to keep taking calls of crying mothers mm. to say, well, my kid's not coming back home. He's 16, he's 50, he's 12. So I, I, I apologize, I took too much of your time, but I'm really hoping we can come up with some solutions, we can work together. I'm not saying Kids Play needs millions of dollars and we can solve all the problems. Yes, we would definitely we need funding to do more, but together. It's not just Kids Play that can solve all the issues. Mm. Um, and just like to leave with a little bit, I, I learned about all the good work you've done in the downtown east side mm. uh, back when you were really young, and I'm assuming that's one of the reasons why you're out here trying to do better for the province, but uh, I'm sure those individuals, those homeless individuals that were back there that you were advocating for, I'm sure they got something more out of it. And I know, and I'm really hoping and praying that we can do more for these kids so they don't end up in the downtown east side because right that's what's happening. Thank right you. on, Karen, thank you. Well, thank you, Karen. Thank you for your passion, and uh, and thanks for your work for kids. It sounds like remarkable work that you're doing uh, with Kids Place Foundation, and uh, and for that uh, boy whose story you told us and his family, and for all those other kids too. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that I learned when I was working, as you mentioned, when I was much younger uh, in the downtown east side, uh, is that. Um, when you're front line, when you're talking to people who are struggling like that, whether it's parents or kids, you see gaps. You see opportunities to intervene and change people's lives in the system. And it's very hard when you get to where I am to see those gaps that you're seeing every day with those kids. Um, so if you, it sounds like you're seeing a lot of opportunities for us to intervene. Um, and, uh, and there's a guy right beside you who's going to get your information. I want to hear what those are want to work on them because we are putting resources in for kids. We're putting mental health and addiction resources in. We're opening a foundry in Surrey. Now they're uh, struggling a little bit financially, but we're going to support them. We're going to get that done. Uh, it's a place where kids can drop in uh, that are at risk in a bunch of ways. We fund the anti-gang programs. We're funding breakfast programs. We're funding all these things. But that's what I see at my level. What you see at your level is something totally different. So I need your experience. I need your help. And thank you for standing up to offer and telling that story and, and being brave in front of the whole room to be passionate about those kids uh, because you're who makes the difference for them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just uh, one final question from the Surrey Board of Trade. And uh, yeah. I'm already halfway out the door. Uh, you Thanks, know, Anita. The greatest yeah. burden on business is taxation. Mm -hmm. uh, so will the government commit to a comprehensive review of taxes that businesses are facing and the red tape behind them, such as the employer's health tax, the provincial sales tax? Well, uh, Anita, we're always ready to work with you, to work with the Board of Trade again. And it's, it's obviously a different topic than Karen and the kids she works with. But the, the real experiences of businesses dealing with the provincial government, dealing with our paperwork, dealing with our rules, is so invaluable to me uh, as Premier to effectively ensure that our team is uh, delivering the kind of government that people deserve. And that's around tax, uh, but around uh, so many other areas as well. So uh, committed to work with you on that uh, and, uh, and happy to, to work on you with that. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to ask Milan Mann of the BM Group to thank you on stage. Milan, please come forward. Much. A round of applause thank you, for Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.
And just a few words from the BM Group, your other co-presenting sponsor. We're not finished yet. Milan, over to you. I won't take too much of your time. I know it's a busy Friday. So uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Milan Mon, President of Real Estate Development and Construction at the BM Group of Companies. On behalf of BMG, we are honored to be the co-presenting sponsors of today's event. As a longtime member of the Surrey Board of Trade and a sponsor of many of these events, um, these events affords us the opportunity to strengthen our relationship to the community, uh, to the communities we operate and live in through having discussions about the issues we face every day. The BM group of companies represents 18 companies grounded in construction with con uh, offices internationally supported by a team of over 500. From de abatement and demolition to waterproofing, structural restoration and roofing to our material supply division consisting of steel fabrication, um, precast concrete products and material supply. Um, all the way through to our real estate development, uh, land development and contracting from, uh, we interact with construction from every stage of a project's life cycle. This diversity allows us the unique opportunity to approach the industry from multiple points of view and in turn experience the issues we've discussed today in different ways. As we've come to know, doing business has become increasingly difficult. Financial pressures, staffing challenges, red tape within different levels of government. As we continue to navigate the turbulence, we've done what we can to combat these challenges. We've started a staffing and labor company to not only address our own needs, but address the needs of our clients. We've implemented flexible deposit programs on our own developments to incentivize home ownership and entry into the housing market. We continue in the midst of a cement shortage last year and ongoing material challenges. We moved into logistics, hauling materials in from other parts of the world to fulfill our clients' needs and remain competitive in the market. And this pivot highlights the need to take a closer look at the materials we produce locally and their relationship to the pace of the local construction industry. We know these issues do not operate in isolation. Uh, they are deeply interconnected and their compounding natures create challenges throughout industries and communities. As we know, with increased population comes in, uh, intense housing demands and the need for infrastructure to support these growing communities. To accomplish all this, we need to educate uh, the next generation, including new Canadians, to fill the staffing voids and keep up with our province's growth rate. So as these, uh, as these points affect everyone ac across the political spectrum, I'm confident we can forge a path forward through collaboration of public and private sectors, and our very own Surrey Board of Trade is often the steward of these conversations, like today. So as I conclude, I'd like to thank Premier Eby for his time and his bold vision and the Surrey Board of Trade for organizing another fruitful event. So thank you. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you so much to the BD Group, the BM Group, Simon Fraser University, Kwantlen Polytechnic University, and thank you to all of you. I wish you an amazing weekend. Make it a great business day. Thank you. Thank you.